my honor and privilege to be with you today. This is my first time visiting this uh, Divinity School, which I find sort of hard to believe, but uh, glad to be here and finally see this place and be in your community. A reading from the fifth book of Daniel from the um, translation, The Message. King Belshazzar held a great feast for his 1,000 nobles. The wine flowed freely. Belshazzar, heady with the wine, ordered that the gold and silver chalices his father Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from God's temple of Jerusalem be brought in so that he and his nobles, his wives, and concubines could drink from them. They drank the wine and drunkenly praised their gods made of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. At that very moment, the fingers of a human hand appeared and began writing on the lamp-illumined, whitewashed wall of the palace. When the king saw the disembodied hand writing away, he went white as a ghost, scared out of his wits. His legs went limp and his knees knocked. He yelled out for the enchanters, the fortune tellers, and the diviners to come. He told these Babylonian magi, anyone who can read the writing on the wall and tell me what it means will be famous and rich. Purple rolled, purple robe, the great gold chain, and be third in command in the kingdom. One after another they tried, but could make no sense of it. They could neither read what was written nor interpret it to the king. So now the king was really frightened. All the blood drained from his face. The nobles were in a panic. The queen heard of the hysteria among the king and his nobles and came to the banquet hall. She said, long live the king. Don't be upset. Don't sit around looking like ghosts. There is a man in your kingdom who is full of the divine Holy Spirit. During your father's time, he was well known for his intellectual brilliance and spiritual wisdom. He was so good that your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him the head of all the magicians, enchanters, fortune tellers, and diviners. There was no one quite like him. He could do anything, interpret dreams, solve mysteries, explain puzzles. His name is Daniel. Have Daniel called in. He'll tell you what is going on here. So Daniel was called in. The king asked him, are you the Daniel who is one of the Jewish exiles my father brought here from Judah? I've heard about you, that you're full of the Holy Spirit, that you've got a brilliant mind, and that you are incredibly wise. The wise men and the enchanters were brought in here to read this writing on the wall and interpret it for me, but they couldn't figure it out. Not a word, not a syllable. But I've heard you interpret dreams and solve mysteries. So, if you can read the writing and interpret it for me, you'll be rich and famous, a purple robe, the great gold chain around your neck, and third in command in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, you can keep your gifts or give them to someone else. But I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Listen, O king. The high God gave your father a great kingdom and a glorious reputation. Because God made him so famous, people from everywhere, whatever their race, color, and creed, were totally intimidated by him. He killed or spared people on whim. He promoted or humiliated people capriciously. He developed a big head and a hard spirit. Then God knocked him off his high horse and stripped him of his fame. He was thrown out of human company, lost his mind, and lived like a wild animal. Until he learned his lesson, that the high God rules human kingdoms and puts anyone God wants in charge. You are his son and have known all this, yet you're as arrogant as ever as he was. Look at you setting yourself up in competition against the master of heaven. You had the sacred chalices from the temple brought into your drunken party so that you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines could drink from them. You used the sacred chalices to toast your gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, blind, deaf, and imbecile gods. But you treat with contempt the living God who holds your entire life from birth to death in God's hand. God sent the hand that wrote on the wall, and this is what is written. Many, Tekel, and Paris. This is what the words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your rule, and they don't add up. Tekel, 
you have been weighed on the scales and you don't weigh much. Paris, your kingdom has been divided up and handed over to the Medes and Persians. Belshazzar did what he had promised. He robed Daniel in purple, draped the great gold chain around his neck, and promoted him third in charge in the kingdom. That same night, the Babylonian king Belshazzar was murdered. Darius the Mede was 62 years old when he ascended into the kingdom. Will you pray with me? God, may your name be blessed forever and ever, since wisdom and power are yours alone. It is you who controls the procession of times and seasons, who makes and unmakes kings, who confers wisdom on the wise and knowledge on those with discernment, who uncovers depths and mysteries, who knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with you. Amen. I am someone who has always wanted to have more trust in God and in God's wisdom and power. I want to be able to see what God sees and thus have that wisdom and power for myself. The people whose faith I most admire are the ones who are content with mysteries and all that lies in darkness because they rely on God's power to see for them. I want their faith. Thus, the figure of Daniel, whose prayer I just prayed, has always appealed to me. I read the tale we just heard from the book named after him as the story of one who, with impressive faith, resists imperial power and trusts in God's power instead. As you heard, the story begins with a whopping party in progress in the royal court. The king and his friends are on a blasphemous binge even going so far as to drink out of chalices stolen from the temple. But the king, who thinks he can get away with anything because he sits upon a throne at the center of the empire, is suddenly presented with a mysterious vision inscribed on the wall. It's a riddle, and he doesn't know the answer to it. He can't even read it. And he is deeply unnerved by this, deeply unnerved by his own illiteracy. His bureaucracy is frustrated, too. They cannot, by their own power, that is, the power of the gods of wealth and privilege, help him out by reading the inscription. In the biblical text, we are not told just what is so frightening about this mysterious message. But we get the point that somehow the king knows that the writing is on the wall, so to speak, and that his days may be numbered. Thus the arrival of Daniel, introduced by the queen, and it's a complicated moment for the king. He needs Daniel's help on the one hand, but he probably resents it immensely on the other hand. This exile from Judah, one of his father's chosen advisors, has the power to save him because he has an ability and a skill that the king does not. The king also perhaps realizes on some level that Daniel is about to subvert the king's power and authority by speaking a truth he does not want to hear. It may also be a complicated moment for Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar had specially chosen him to serve in the royal court, but he is not of royalty. He is still one of the 99%, as we might say. He has not really entered the ranks of the privileged 1%. Daniel Berrigan observes that this sort of standing in the royal court is a dubious distinction. Quote, the tactic is common enough, and within the imperial ideology, it makes sound sense. To wit, single out, segregate the best of the enslaved population, stroke their ego, offer compensation and comforts bond with them, enlist them in the adventure of an empire, offer relief from the rigors of exile, beckon them to the good life, thus a new silken enslavement replaces the former brutal one." 
Now we have the son of King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar, making Daniel think he is his chosen one by dangling in front of him the symbols of power, that purple cloak, that gold chain, and the rank of third in the kingdom. So the question is, will Daniel let himself be enslaved by these tokens of power? My favorite moment in the story is when Daniel says no. He rebuffs the king's offer of rewards. You can keep your gifts or give them to somebody else. The prophet does agree to offer his skills at interpretation, but he will do so for his own reasons and on his own terms. He will reject the bribery, I suggest, that is implied in, this proffered to- in the proffered tokens of imperial power. And Daniel delivers a withering critique of the king's illiteracy, which is really ignorance and denial of God. Look at you, Daniel chastises him, setting yourself up in competition against God. You treat with contempt the living God who holds your entire life and death in his hand. Next, Daniel interprets the words on the wall, which of course deliver a further indictment of the king and a warning. As our translation reads it, God has numbered the days of your rule and they don't add up. You've been weighed on the scales and you don't weigh much. Your kingdom has been divided and handed over. One commentator compares the writing on the wall to the wicked witch's ominous writing in the sky in The Wizard of Oz, surrender Dorothy. (laughs) Except here it's God, right, who's getting the king to surrender and to see his own folly. But I want to return to that moment when Daniel rejects the rewards, for it must have taken courage and faith, and I suspect there is a message there for us. I think one message there is this. We are all held from birth to death in the hand of a living God. Thus, no matter who we are, or how skilled we appear on the outside to be, we don't need to be propped up by rewards. We can serve God best if we trust not in our own abilities, which after all, change, but if we trust in God to do great things in us. We get seduced by powers and principalities of many kinds, whether by the seductive myth that our wealth reflects our worth, or by the false security of the good life Berrigan talked about, that we purchase with our credentials. I think we even get seduced by the praise we receive for being gifted enough to work and study, and for that matter, to deliver named lectureships, at institutions of higher learning such as this one. As you will discover if you come to tonight's workshop, I have developed a theory about the dangers of seductive praise, especially the dangers of praise as used in a tool for the formation of ministers. I counsel seminarians to resist being praised, and I advise their mentors and supervisors not to offer it. As you heard in the introduction, I used to direct the supervised ministries programs at Yale, and I had this workshop where I would tell my supervisors Don't tell your interns how great they are. Don't praise them. Don't say things to them like, oh, you're the best preacher, or oh, you have a natural talent for pastoral care. This did not make me very popular, as you might imagine. Mine is not always a popular voice on this matter about praise, but then I've been known to promote unpopular ideas. I have to say, I was tickled to read a little bit about J.C. Wynn and discover that one of his publications was a book called Christian Education for Liberation and Other Upsetting Ideas. (laughs) I thought that I would have liked this guy. There are many reasons that I counsel against praise, and I won't spoil the workshop uh, that I'm giving tonight by outlining all of the reasons, but let me just very briefly suggest three of them here. First, Praise is almost always a cheap shortcut, right? It's harder, after all, than taking the time to offer the sort of substantive, concrete feedback that I counsel instead. Praise is what King Belshazzar offered Daniel, a token that can be quickly thrown around someone's shoulders or put around their neck that does temporarily make them feel good. Second, 
Praise keeps the praise giver in a position of power. It strokes the other person's ego and makes them feel grateful, but it is one form of silken enslavement. King Belshazzar knew this. He knew that when he offered Daniel the symbols of royal power, it didn't really mean that he would lose any power himself. And third and finally, praise makes the praise giver feel good. One can take great pride in seeing one's protégés succeed. This, I think, is one reason that parents often get very addicted to praising their children, telling them things like, oh, you're a genius, or oh, you're just the best, or you're number one, or you can do anything you want, right? If their children are the best and number one and geniuses, they must be too, right? They raised them, after all. I don't know whether in, in his work on families, J.C. Wynne ever talked about this almost irresistible urge that parents have to tell their children how great they are, but it does often seem that stroking somebody else's ego is ultimately a way to stroke one's own. So, are you a Daniel or a King Belshazzar? Daniel knew that King Belshazzar got it wrong. Being great in the eyes of God is not, what, is not about what you can do or cannot do. Literate or illiterate, intellectually brilliant or still learning, spiritually wise or just a novice, these so-called inborn gifts do not make you who you are. It is what you do with them. The king was deeply unnerved and upset because he didn't think he had what it took to interpret dreams, to solve mysteries, and to explain puzzles. He thought that lacking these abilities rendered him shameful before those who did have them. And so his solution was to buy those skills in somebody else. Daniel, on the other hand, represents someone who believes in himself because he believes he is beloved by God. He doesn't believe in his abilities, per se. His self-assurance and self-worth reside neither in how great he is or is not. It resides elsewhere. Yes, Daniel is good at interpretation, and in the end, he goes ahead and explains the, the writing on the wall. He does go ahead and exercise his skill, as the king asked him to. But he did not become good at that skill or any other skill because he thought he had something within him that the king did not. No, he trusted in God, who knows all mysteries to do great things in him. Who knows where God may take him next? In the words of our hymn, he rejected a mortal crown and took on an immortal one. And he lay his honors down in order to press with vigor solely and simply because it would give God the glory. God demands our zeal and calls us to press on for God's sake and in that adventure to find the best reward of all. Amen. <laughs>